I will ramble and I will talk about um, all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, as it says here, tangents. I'm good at tangents. Well, I think I'm good at tangents. I like tangents. Um, so I'm going to talk through the main kind of topic of my slide here. So um, a while ago, one of my friends from quite a long time ago said, what are you doing these days? And I said, well, I'm, I'm using a modular synth and a, a modified games console from the 1980s, like thousands of pounds worth of synthesizer uh, and this, this old crappy games console to draw spirals and things on a screen. And, uh, and that was quite funny. Um, and through the process of me doing that and um, this little sparkly thing up here, uh, some interesting things have happened uh, to me over the however many years. So um, I think my way into where we are now, here today, I made this um, guide for how to modify an old games console. I'll skip through slides and I'll skip back, so don't worry. Um, I've got 111. Um, this is an old games console from the 1980s and uh, it works like a fancy oscilloscope and you can draw things on it so that you can see the game here. And on a particular web forum, uh, Lars Larsen posted, oh, here's some experiments that I've done modifying one of these things and uh, sending audio signals into it, which was quite interesting. Um, but it was, I, c I didn't really get it. I'm not an electronics wizard or anything. Um, so, I tried to collect all of this information together and piece it into one particular thing, a PDF, which I then put on the internet and uh, people found it quite useful, which was good. Um, and I've enjoyed being invited to things like this because of that. So, uh, oh yeah, so that, that's, that's, Alex is the chap who suggested that I have a look at this particular uh, forum about that um, modification and uh, so I, I like it says I tried to make sense out of it and, and piece it together uh, so here's some images from the modification guide and before I came downstairs Derek Holzer was upstairs just um, trying to fix another one like this which was good to see on the screen I was happy happy to see that it's real it's get getting used there's some good warning signs on there parts of a television or a, a CRT cathode ray tube thing not to touch because you might die and um, what what it allows me to do as far as once the modification has been done is to play about with uh, being really loud <laughs> turn me down <laughs> With three-dimensional time. <laughs> that sounds too weird when you turn me up. <laughs> All right. So it allows me to play with, with time in three dimensions. Left, right, up, down, whatever. Uh, backwards and forwards. Thinking about things in a, in a weird kind of way. And uh, for me, I think that was, that was quite good fun. And so I would use a modular, and I still do use a modular synthesizer to... Um, to, to draw these images on a screen and uh, so this is an example of one really useful module that I use for, for that sort of thing just to kind of position things in the right sort of place on the Vectrex game console screen uh, and so I send signals in uh, over on this side and then signals come out I don't know if you can see uh, from the, the right hand side of that there's a few modules that I use that are really useful for um, for doing stuff, kind of obvious. Uh, if you know much about modular synthesizers, some people really like the Make Noise company and the modules that they make. So that's two that that work quite interestingly to make some f fun images like that. I think was what I was using to do that, but I can't really remember now. Um, and this is. This is a more common, this gives you a more common kind of effect that a lot of um, people that are doing this sort of thing use um, a, a phase shift of two signals so that they can start by making a circle or a square or something like that. Um, and so what this allows you to do is, starting up at the top you've got a sine wave, but you can shift it over so you can make it more into a, into a circle and then do things with that. Um, and get more fancy and stuff that I don't really understand, which I quite like not understanding. Um, so here's some examples of some images that I've been making over the however many 
uh, years that I've been doing this now and from bits of performances and stuff like that. This, I'll move my mouse. This particular way of getting this image to work has just frustrated me like crazy. And uh, I did, I think I have managed to master it because using a modular synthesizer, it can be quite a chance um, way of doing things where you just start plugging stuff in and seeing what happens and who knows. And then when you try and recreate it, it can be a bit difficult. And so I've done stuff like this for a while, but not really understood how I'd done it. And I think if I can get it fixed for the weekend when I've got to perform, then I'll be happy. But if I don't, then shit. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, well, another thing that's quite interesting over time is these, these Vectrex games consoles um, command a certain amount of money. I've got them quite cheap, um, but I started getting these a few years ago, and I've got a few now. Um, and other people have been buying them in various states of repair. But also, uh, console games console collectors like to get these sorts of things. And I, I've contributed to um, difficulties that console collectors might have now, because there's this other gang of, of people that are buying these things and not using them to play games on, but using them to do other stuff. So, yeah, that's, that went down well. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about me, just because I've got ages. Um, I did fine art in the UK uh, in the early 90s and studied video art, or tried to, and practiced video art. I was more interested in uh, video feedback and things like that back then. Um, but, but that sort of thing, without the internet, was quite a difficult world to, to participate in because things weren't being, being shared very well. And so we just used to have to go to the library at the art college and, and look in old magazines and books and stuff like that. And sometimes there'd be videos, but they were pretty terrible condition. And been too many copies, watched too many times, chewed up and stuff like that. So. There was some interesting stuff on British television in the 80s. And I used to go to this thing called Video Positive in uh, Liverpool and see some quite interesting things. But that was the sort of late 80s as well. Um, but it was one of these weird sort of genres in the UK that the UK had a really good history of. But as far as I could see, it wasn't very well documented in the art school that I was at. So um, it was sort of there, but then it wasn't. The, that time of, of the, the 90s was quite interesting because people were going out quite a lot, I was, and so I got more sidetracked into making techno and DJing and stuff like that. Uh, and then I thought I should try and get a proper job, so I did uh, a master's in design and digital media uh, it, with the intention of learning how to make websites and just totally didn't do that. I, I discovered Max MSP and started making um, a, an audio visualizer for my final project. Um, pre-jitter if you know about any of that sort of stuff. So there wasn't anything really that was easy to get hold of that you could use to control things on the screen. Um, NATO was around, but that was really expensive. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, good. Did anyone buy NATO? Fucking hell, really. <laughs> um, and then, um, oh yeah, I've got images to, su to supplement this. Uh, yeah, and then I started teaching um, in the early 2000s and then started running this modular meet, um, which is quite interesting as well to get to meet people that do modular synthesizers for whatever reason. Here's an example of some video feedback if you don't know what that sort of thing looks like. These aren't my images, but I'd sit for a long time just pointing a camera at its own image on a TV and, and make patterns, uh, which was really good fun especially in the early 90s. Uh, here's an example of something that I made when I was at university. And, uh, and you can see the origins of doing something that's really fucking dangerous. <laughs> so this was my old television. And I, uh, I had these little telephone coil pickup microphones, the ones that you could put onto a telephone. Uh, so you could amplify the earpiece for someone that was hard of hearing or whatever. Um, and I just plugged them into this really crappy Sony mixer and then into my space echo and would just change the speed of the tape going round. But these things were, the little microphones were just sort of dropped in the back of the television on top of the tube um, on things that I didn't really understand like the transformer and other bits. 
that I still don't really know the names of. And I'm not really that bothered about it. It was really dangerous. Um, when I did my final um, show for my, my degree, they had to cordon off the room that I used, so you weren't allowed to pass a certain point because it was so dangerous. But they let me do stuff like this, so it's a bit weird. Um, it was fun, though. I think I did get a few little shocks, but nothing, nothing too bad. Uh, oh, yeah, and so now I organize this Brighton Modular Meet thing at Sussex University where we have lots of people bring in modular synthesizers. There's a room for video synthesizers. Chris, cheers. Um, video circuits room and people bring things, just turn up on the day with, with gear. We've got big monitors that people can use and stuff like that. And so that's, that's really interesting to be exposed to, to stuff that you wouldn't necessarily see um, because, well, you can see it on the internet, I guess, but um, but to actually have these things as a tangible thing right in front of you, I think that's really good. Um, so just a, I don't know, off my tangent, back on to the thing that I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, oscillographics, which is the thing that we're, one of the things that we're sort of looking at here, um, making, making these sorts of images uh, on screens, they can sound pretty nasty, and so can being at a modular meet a synth meet where everyone's just put their synthesizers on full volume and they're sort of fighting for who's, who's got the loudest amp or whatever. So it's quite nice, I found after going to a few of them and taking this kind of setup with me, oh, I could just have a rest from trying to compete and make a load of noise and I can just sit and make cool pictures on my Vectrex and people come over and go, oh wow, what's that? I say, oh, I remember those. And so you get this other kind of dynamic in a modular synth meet where people are less interested in all of this sort of thing and then become more interested and, and this sort of nostalgia comes out about the, uh, the games console, uh, which is really interesting. Um, here's a picture of my creative process. Has anyone got a little laser thing that you can just sit and... Yeah, I found one. I, I think my stepson bought it for me ages ago and I just found it again the other, the other week. Uh, is it uh, just a little one with a little galvo and a mirror in it? Oh. Okay, this one just takes three AAA batteries. I nearly brought it, but I thought I might get told off on the plane. <laughs> um, this is from an old photography book from the 1970s, I think, and I thought that was quite a, an interesting... The interesting that this appears in this book and... Not much else was made of it, really. It was, it was there for a bit, and it disappeared. Um, oh, yeah, so I'm talking about when I was at art college and things, I think, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> something really key happened, as well as um, being at university in the early 90s and going out a lot. There was this exhibition of Gary Hill's work at the um, Oxford MoMA, and, uh, and I went to that, and... Most of it was televisions in weird sorts of configurations showing things in particular sorts of ways and interesting narrative work and stuff like that with them. But the, this was the picture on the back page of the catalogue. And, and I kept the catalogue because you do, you keep stuff. And um, go back to it every now and again. Or I'd go and visit my mum and I'd have a look in my old bedroom and find these things and go, oh yeah, I've got that Gary Hill catalogue, haven't I? And I look at it and get to the back page and go, what the hell is all of this stuff? Just, just wonder what these things were, and I think there's a rotetra. Is that a rotetra over there? And there's what's that underneath there? <laughs> Why is he just put it under there? <laughs> and then what's that? something else. So it, I'm glad that these things had just been in the back of my mind for all of this time and, and just creating a sort of wonderment in me for, for stuff. Um, oh yeah, my next slide is, uh, <laughs> is about using Macs in the late 90s. Um, that, when it used to look like that, it was ace, wasn't it? <laughs> Um, and what was quite interesting when I started using Macs was that I realized that I needed to be reasonable at maths. And then I remembered that I wasn't reasonable at, using, at maths at all. Um, so I had to make things that did sums for me in the software, which was quite an interesting process just to try and cheat. Uh, and then I cheated even more in the way that I used it. Um, but I made an audio visualizer in, in that software 
uh, in OS 9 without, yeah, I think I was just controlling QuickTime movies or something like that and just controlling how they played along the timeline. But I was using computers more and more by that time and uh, it seemed like this became a big problem and that's why I had the slide of the internet at the beginning if you saw that, um, where it was just, computers seemed to get in the way of me doing stuff and I was trying to do electronic music on computers and that was a pain in the neck, I had all these old synthesizers, oh let's try and hook them up to the computer, oh no that's not going to work is it, um, so trying to separate these two things out and I'm, I'm rambling in a tangential way here, I'd rather not use computers at the moment to, to do creative work. So um, there's a slide about that in a bit, maybe. Uh, and also, yeah, I realize that I'm not any of these. So I'm, I'm no good at maths. I'm not a computer wizard. And I can't play music either. So it's quite interesting getting into modular synthesizers and just not needing to care about any of that sort of stuff and just being able to kind of not cheat, but just use these way that these sorts of systems can work to do stuff. Uh, and I've probably ended up becoming a bit of a jack of all trades and, and not really mastering anything. Um, I think that, that I think is important though with the stuff that I've been doing and the, the things that um, you'll see here and my interest in those sorts of things is is this idea that you can draw with sound. And, and this has been something that's been around for a long time and uh, I'd, I like to, I've tried to think about sort of automated processes with this and looked at various different ways that that sort of thing can be done and happen and things and I think when you buy a, when you start to build a modular synthesizer or when you build any kind of electronic music sort of thing, that there comes a, a point where these sorts of things are sort of automated. You, if, you've, if you're using a digital audio workstation, you're going to program faders to come up and down and, and sort of do the timing and all of that sort of thing. And with, with these kinds of things for, for drawing on the screen, um, I feel like I've made a machine now that will, will do that for me. I'll have to try and configure it and control things a bit, but that, that's interesting to me. And so, some of the background of that for me comes from mm. um, and, and things that have influenced me over the years comes from the next bunch of slides, the next images that, that I'm going to talk about. So William Burroughs and Brian Geisen um, developed this cut-up technique. I think it was more Geisen than Burroughs, but then Burroughs applied it to um, the Naked Lunch book in the late 50s. And that that He'd write a load of stuff, if you don't know what this process was, he'd write a load of stuff out and then chop the page up and then sort of reassemble it and it would create this kind of new random maybe-ish narrative and you could read through it and wonder why things were connected to whatever they were connected to and just challenge the way that you would think about things. Um, but I, I found out about Burroughs just through, I don't know, whatever people at school that I was with being interested in beat poets and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and I found that Brian Geisen was more interesting, really. Um, this is a thing that they worked on with another person called Ian Somerville. Has anyone had a go on one of these, a dream machine? It's pretty good, isn't it? Shut your eyes, flickering happens, you might start seeing some shapes and stuff. Um, I got a bit obsessed with these you're allowing your brain just to, to do stuff without actually looking at anything. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, I've gone on a, a sidewards thing here. Um, so this is where they got the idea about that sort of thing from. So this is Gray Walter, um, uh, this book called The Living Brain, which is where he talks about that sort of thing. And it's to do with um, frequencies in your brain. I'm not going to go into it any more than that because I can't remember. Um, but he's... He's important because he made the, he's a cybernetic pioneer and made these little robot things that were quite autonomous, little turtle things. Were they ducks? Elsie, anyway. Um, that's, that's him with his little cybernetic thing. But Brian Geisen um, was doing these in really interesting paintings in the, in the 60s. And um, he could write in quite a lot of different sort of languages, uh, and he would combine these kind of things into into one image and would use both hands to paint with, would use rollers to sort of mark things out and 
turned this into a kind of automatic sort of process, I think, and a, and a stream of consciousness sort of thing, and allowed there to be a sort of flow in the process of doing that. And, uh, and I, looking at these things, I find them really interesting to, to just get lost in and wonder what's going on with a particular part of the image. Um, there was somewhat, when I was at college, there was, there was this lad doing this on my course, and I don't think he'd ever seen any of Brian Geisen's paintings, but he would just sit with these big canvases and he would just, just do these patterns relentlessly and fill them up with, I'm rem I remember more looking like that than anything, and he was a total process guy, which was really interesting. He would just draw the same thing on page after page after page in his sketchbooks. Um, and then make a painting out of the last version of it and stuff like that, which I thought was great. Uh, he was a robot in that sense. And um, that sort of aesthetic really stuck with me, and it was good to, to look at Brian Geisen's things as well and just think, oh, yeah, yeah, I like that sort of thing. Burroughs and Geisen worked together on this book called The Third Mind as well, which was quite an interesting um, concept where they, there's all sorts of cut-ups and kind of art stuff in there from start to finish, and they, the idea behind it was that between the two of them working together on this book, a single mind each, that they would then create another mind by doing that sort of thing together. And uh, I think it just left me something to think about and give me something to wonder about, really. Um, oh yeah, and so th this kind of stuff, this sort of collage and this sort of piecing things together, I can connect that now. To, to how we use our modular synthesizers where we just get a bunch of stuff from a bunch of different companies and we just mash it all together. We just, oh, well, we've got something from that company, they're really good, but the rest of the stuff that they make is shit, so I'm not going to bother with it. This is good, they're good. I've been a bit elitist here and I've used um, one of my friend's companies and uh, somebody else, another company, but whatever, you get the point. Um, oh yeah, so somebody else who... I'm not really bothered about his paintings. I mean, they look similar, I guess, to this sort of thing, but they were done in a different way. Um, but Jackson Pollock talked about a lot when I was an art student and um, really important. Splatting paint around. Um, and his partner, Lee Krasner, encouraging him to do this sort of stuff. Um, but what I hadn't really thought about this person's work for quite a long time. Um, here's an example of one of them. But I was at a design conference um, that, I, that I try and get my students to go to, and this one particular speaker has been presenting at this thing quite regularly. And um, in one talk, he was talking about how he really liked the, the action of Jackson Pollock's action painting, and he, like, he compared it to his code and stuff. And so th this is the important bit here. There's a gap between the canvas that has the paint on it and the paint and the, the brush where the paint starts. Uh, and so that guy is Joshua Davis, and he, he writes code for, um, he's writing code in Flash, uh, action script code, and he's got his own um, language, what's it called now? Uh, hype, the hype network stuff, hype framework, sorry. And it, it's like processing and, and a lot of those sorts of things for um, scripting, algorithmic, random drawing and stuff like that. But he's, he likes the idea of not touching the canvas as well. Um, and so, oh yeah, so here's an example of part where th he'll get through the process of things and he'll end up with a load of stuff in an Illustrator file that he'll then have to kind of edit. And I guess we're going through that sort of editing process when we've randomly connected a lot of stuff, or I, I feel like I do, randomly collected, connected a lot of modules together and then try and make sense out of it and sort of formalize it in some sense. Uh, and so that would be the same sort of thing as what Joshua Davis would do. Um, I like him, he's good. What I just said. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, so... Um, I, I've been bewildered and amazed by, by art that I've looked at over the years, and I think that's, that's a good position to be in, rather than, um, I mean, you get bored by some of the stuff that you see as well, but um, kind of awestruck by, by what's going on with these sorts of things. And then also, and how, how do you get to these kind of resultant images through, through some kind of process? Uh, and whether, like, doing these bits of computer art, writing some code or whatever, 
Um, I, I'm at the point, and I have been for a long time, like after stopping using Macs, I, I use it in bits of teaching, but um, I don't really want to use it much for, for making stuff, especially my own work. Um, I might work on a project with somebody else with it, but um, I, I, I don't really want to understand like the nitty gritty of how something works. I'm happier just to be able to kind of get what's going on with it and and understand that you can just connect this, that, and the other together and that you will get some kind of result at the end of that. And uh, and then I'll be able to maintain some kind of awe over the thing and, and be, be impressed rather than know too much about it. I don't want to spoil the magic. I think that's what I'm getting at there. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to show you some... Um, early bits of oscilloscope art and some influential things. So the, this sort of stuff will get covered again by some other people, Chris and Derek and, and others, hopefully. Yeah? Okay, all right, so hopefully I'm not going to tread on any toes. Or I could just do this. <laughs> so... <laughs> I just wanted to show a few people that I think are really important. I'm not going to talk about them very much um, because I'm, I've got quite a lot of slides. And yeah, I'm doing all right. Um, I'm, some of this, as you're looking through stuff, finding out about bits of work, some people will say, oh, you need to look at some work by so-and-so. And, and you might not actually massively be into that kind of thing. And so sometimes, and I think with this now, I've popped in some bits of work that I think should be here, but I'm not as bothered about them as others. Mary Ellen Butte's images are really interesting in their examples of very early uh, use of oscilloscope work in um, animations and, uh, and film and stuff. Norman McLaren, quite famous for painting on film and, and including these sorts of things in his work. This is a particularly interesting piece. That's the one that's in like 3D, isn't it? Yeah, the dual stereoscopic thing, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's good. Um, my, my superhero is Ben Leposky, though. Um, these are some of the things that he, he created around the same sort of time. So this is early 1950s, so like 1953 or something like that. And, uh, and he built a lot of the, a lot of oscillos, um, oscillators and uh, and connected them up to an oscilloscope, right? And now this this is the thing that for about a year now I've been saying I've got to do that um, field sequential color or field field sequential colorization. So how I think he's got that image is by using this rotating disc that's, that's got different color gels in it and they're, sp they're spinning and um, being able to color the, um, the image uh, as the image is it's showing different images and it matches where the gel is in front of it if you kind of follow me with that. Basically I think I just need to make a big wheel with gels on it and crank it in front of my oscilloscope and then take some pictures and see what that looks like. Has anyone had a go at doing that? Chris, have you done that? <laughs> rather than using a computer that's that's my reasoning for for that i don't really want to do that on a computer um he he wanted to get these sorts of images out into the public anyway so he took a lot of photographs of these um these oscillographics or oscillons as he called them and uh, and tried to get them into uh, magazines and in, into the home, into onto book covers and stuff like that, which I think is really good, um, and and he succeeded in that. And um, I'd like to see more of his work and his great nephew Scooby. Have you uh, you did, uh, did you meet Scooby? You talked to him, so he's trying to write a book about it all, isn't he? So that'd be really good. Um, so he's dug out like the, his old oscilloscope and. Um, circuit diagrams and stuff like that. So um, yeah, so he's he's my my best pioneer. Uh, and then into the 60s, we've got Herbert Frank, um, who was doing similar sorts of things and um, making this sort of work more popular uh, in in books that that he wrote, um, including lots of other people's work and his own computer work. And that, so there he is taking a picture. Look at the size of that oscilloscope screen. 
Imagine having to deal with that. Vector people. <laughs> We're spoilt with vectrexes. Uh, Heinrich Heidesberger. So this is going off. This is probably going into your territory, isn't it, Chris, here with some of these people that... He was swinging something around, wasn't he? This is like pendulum kind of... Yeah. Um, so this isn't photographs of uh, an oscilloscope. This is someone doing a similar aesthetic, but swinging... Was it a light over a over some photographic paper and stuff like that? Yeah. So th these sorts of things look great. And when you manage to make something that looks like that on an oscilloscope, you're pretty chuffed with yourself as well. Um, that's good because it's inverted. That's how I found it on the internet. Oh yeah, and here's, here's a bit of his gadget. Nice bits of scaffolding tubes and stuff like that. Um, a northerner, British northerner, Desmond Paul Henry from Manchester. Um, he was using a similar sort of process um, with various different colored pens and drawing uh, on pieces of paper. And these things just look, like that looks pretty scary. I think these are cool. Weird sort of monster things, um, which are, I think is good. There's an extra, like th these things are quite clean and precise, whereas there's an edge to, to this sort of stuff, which it has some extra kind of, there's a, a little bit more space in this for me to wonder about what's going on with the image and to, to, to think, I don't know, just for, there's room. It's not as prescriptive, I think, as the other Heidenberg, Heidersberger stuff. Uh, and there's, there's a picture of his machine. It's nice and pixely from the internet. Jack Citron, he worked with the Whitney's on um, the stuff that they were doing, wrote software for them. Uh, this is about the only picture I think that I could find on the internet of his sort of oscillographic stuff as well, but an academic writing bits of software and stuff for, for some artists. Uh, I think going back to my arts background uh, as well, and thinking about that sort of thing. And remember, I've tried to remember and reflect on, on this sort of stuff. So uh, now I'm Gabo doing these linear constructions. They, this sort of stuff leads to how um, more how these sorts of aesthetics came into the home, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and, and therefore sort of more accepted into life at a particular point. Um, so from the 50s onwards, you know, going back to the Posky idea of getting some of these oscillons into, onto books and wallpaper or whatever so that they get into people's houses and stuff. Obviously, people aren't just going to pop out and buy a Naum Gabo sculpture, um, but I've, got, I've managed to get a couple of these um, lampshades that are basically the same kind of idea as this sort of thing, which are pretty cheap and they were everywhere in the, in the 60s. Um, tangent. Coming back on track. Man Ray did this interest in um, project human equations and was looking at these mathematical models um, and the, these objects. And he, he exhibited paintings and, and photographs of this sort of stuff. And these things are from the uh, late 1800s. And um, they're, it's like it's vector art, isn't it? <laughs> They're vector drawings, they're 3D drawings, but they're these really elaborate little structures. They're probably about that sort of size with, with string threaded around in them and uh, fascinating little things. And especially if you're kind of bewildered by maths like I am and not really wanting to touch it, but then there's a tangible maths thing here. Um, Victor Vassarelli, someone who would appear quite often in... Um, art books for me when I was at school and uh, look at that, there's a horse, that's well clever that is. And Bridget Riley was one of my favorites and so th this kind of style work was quite popular in, it got reappropriated a bit in the uh, late 80s and early 90s um, on club flyers and stuff like that and so you'd, you'd look for some acid house party thing to go to and there'd be some Bridget Riley-esque sort of pattern on it and it was all a bit psychedelic and you'd think, oh yeah, that's for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to that, that's gonna be really good. Um, going back to these strings and things though, um, this, this lady, uh, Mary Everest Boole, 
maths people, did I get that right? <laughs> I'm not very good at it. So um, she, she tried to make maths more accessible um, by making these, these curve stitching projects for people to do. Um, and, and that kind of thing seemed to continue into people's houses in the 60s and 70s a bit with, with string art. And it's quite interesting going into charity shops still uh, and, and coming across these sorts of things. I tried to select some slightly more abstract ones here, but often you'd, you'd find in a charity shop an owl or a boat or something like that. Or you'd go around to Auntie someone's house, Auntie Mabel or whatever, and there'd be some kind of sunset thing. And they're, they're quite interesting things to see, but then now and again you'd come across something that looked a bit more like that. Uh, and, and I thought, well, that's, that's good, isn't it? That's a good connection to, to what we're looking at. This chap is still doing, I think, still doing stuff now. Um, if you look him up on his, web, on his website, uh, you could buy things like that. I think they're about that sort of size, which would be ace. It would be well tough to have something like that. Um, so nails banged into a board and then carefully strung around everywhere. What a process. Oh, yeah. And these sorts of things were quite a popular toy um, in, well, I, I found that in a charity shop not so long ago, but, but this sort of stuff was also helping to get these kinds of things into people's houses. And, and I mean, as far as I was concerned, messing around with that sort of thing when I was a kid, I was not thinking about maths at all. And that was the, a long way from my mind. I was more interested in that I could just scribble this thing around and make a cool pattern. Um, and maybe that's how I still feel. <laughs> Uh, someone who I think is really important is Bill Etra, as far as this kind of stuff is concerned, um, because of this machine, like I said about before, with the Gary Hill um, picture, the, the Rotetra video synth. And this, was another, this is an example of some other work that was that sort of unobtainable stuff when I was an art student, where somehow I'd seen some of this scan processor stuff. Either it was on BBC Two, in the 1980s on something, or there was a videotape of it in the video library at college or something like that, and you just sit there thinking, how the hell did they do that? What? And what does it mean as well? It, it was, uh, I mean, I don't know. I didn't understand it, so it was good. Um, other stuff that I think is quite interesting to see, that coming up through art college as well and thinking that I should be interested in computer art and things as well and looking at books, um, oh, what was it called? Like the Cybernetic Serendipity uh, catalog and other, there's a couple of other books by um, Jasia, how do you say her name? Jasia, Jason Reichart. Um, there's a nice little Studio Vista book uh, and then they have quite a lot of examples of um, late 70s sort of plotter art and things like that in there. Um, and there was some plotter art at the Cybernetic Serendipity exhibition in, in London in 1968? Yeah, yeah, it was 50 years ago, yeah. Um, all right, so this is, a, this is like an edited and remixed version of a, of a talk that I've done before. And so in here, before I've talked about and shown just quick examples of people that are here at this festival. So I'm not going to talk about any of those people. I'm not going to show you any examples of them. You, you're, you're either here in the audience, and so you'll know your own work, or you're going to stick around and you're going to see some of these people. So some other people that I think are important, whether they have anything going on at the moment or not, is sometimes a bit of a mystery, um, and, uh, and other people that, for one reason or another, aren't here. Um, one of my friends talked about this guy, Duncan Malashock, he's quite difficult to find information about. He's got a weird Instagram. Do you know anything about him, Chris? No. Yeah, he's got, he's, he's got some videos on Vimeo and YouTube that, that look like they're colored versions of um, Vectrex stuff. And I have a feeling that he might have modified a Vectrex before me <laughs> a while ago. Um, this video is amazing. Just, just go and look him up on, uh, on YouTube or Vimeo. Um, they're, they're really noisy and they're just kind of procedural, sort of drawn. This is this crazy kind of temple thing that just makes a load of noise and appears and is colored in, which is great. And so however he's done it, I don't know. 
it, I don't think it's computers, um, but he was part of this computers club thing that was people making kind of glitch art and, and sharing those sorts of things, making all sorts of gifts and stuff on the internet a while ago. Um, but yeah, his his work just you just sit and watch it and go, what the hell's going on with this? He's also made some. Um, I think the most recent thing that he did was all, all this kind of 70s style lounge music, which which is great. Kyle <laughs> um, Evans was. Um, he's still he's still doing stuff, isn't he? I encountered Chris at a workshop unknowingly quite a few years ago, um, where we were building a, um, a it was an RF modulator sort of circuit thing, wasn't it? On just some copper plates, just to broadcast telly at a television. Um, but but he did this project, and I should have put the year on. I can't remember what when it was that he did this. Um, so it's a modified television to scribble oscillographics on the screen uh, and he's holding it as if he's got an accordion in his hand and he's got some um, buttons on the side of it and he's it's got little sensors and he can move it around and it's screaming at you so there must be some oscill oscillators in there and that's how it's doing what it's doing um, but he's worth checking out Gary Hill oh, I've talked about him three times now um, it was interesting digging around on the internet a bit and coming back to him actually and finding that he's still doing these sorts of oscillographic images. These are very recent um, because I think I'd seen a lot of this sort of oscilloscope stuff from the early 70s by him and then seen more and more and more over the years narrative based pieces that he'd done and then to see these things they weren't even on his website they were on another gallery website or something but to see these done in the 2010s onwards like nows um, was was really good um, so whether he's aware of stuff that you know current cool thing whatever I don't know um, hopefully he is Mark Lycan uh, did this project called Oscillon Response a few years ago, and this is um, performances around, based around the um, Ben Leposky stuff. And he was one of the first people that I had any contact with um, outside of my circle uh, to do with anything to, of, of these sorts of oscillographics things. I think he just sent me a message on Facebook or something. Um, and because I put a picture on and or someone had said, oh, look at what Mark's doing, look at what Andrew's doing or something like that. And so that was quite good to have a chat with someone about it. And I think we were talking about, it helped me to understand what was going on with, with these kinds of things. So I think I'd, he'd shared a picture of Ben Leposky's studio or something like that. And, um, and I'd said, oh, it looks a bit like a synthesizer, doesn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, in that kind of like silly throwaway chit chat on the internet and um, he said yeah it's pretty much an analog computer uh, thought, oh right okay so that sort of thing started to make a bit more sense to me um, so he, he was doing performances a couple of years ago around that kind of thing I haven't seen one unfortunately um, he's based up in Scotland and that's not a really an excuse um, but it's a long way away from where I live <laughs> um, some of you might have encountered Benton over the years, um, he, based in New York, has done a f quite a few little projects with uh, with modified Vectrex, and um, he shared. He, he he was one of the first people that I realised I came to realise had used my modification document because I think he just posted a picture of him using it with someone on uh, what's it on Instagram and. Uh, and then we've had a bit of chit chat on the forum that I showed you the picture from right at the beginning where Lars had shown that thing. So there was discussion um, online about, about it and then he'd get in touch with me and say, oh, I've worked out how to do this. And so this one, I think he's, he's got outputs and inputs to the, um, to the Vectrex. So he can send an output from one machine and into the other one to get stuff to happen. So he's getting a bit kind of post Vectrex. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, so the game can still be, so the game's playing, isn't it? And Right. Scary. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's, so that's, uh, I'm quite, I'm impressed with, with what he was doing with that. He, he, he was nudging me to try and work out 
wiring up switch injects and, and things like that, which is, I've only done that once in, in a modification that I've, that I've done. Um, I guess now that it's kind of gone out there for other people, I just kind of just go, yeah, good, you've done that, that's great, I'm really happy about that, I can use that in a slide. <laughs> um, here's another example of something, uh, Lisa Joy, <laughs> and uh, I copied him. I stole this module idea off him because I thought, oh yeah, I could use that, that's really good. Um, I'm not going to paint a Vectrex white though. I like I like to keep them as they are. Um, so so that's that bit. Um, has anyone chatted with Nathan? This contraption is just ridiculous, isn't it? Is he? <laughs> He's bonkers. He's based in Australia. Shipping. <laughs> One word. <laughs> Look at it. So I had that picture for quite a while, and I've used that before, and then I came across this one, and I just thought, this is just next level, isn't it? Look at it. Yeah. Nah, he's, he's got a plotter stuck on the top of it as well. He's done it. It's incredible. Yeah, someone should buy that. No, I'm not going to. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Joe Hyde, uh, so he organizes a conference in the UK called Seeing Sound and, uh, and he's encouraged a few of us in the UK with this sort of thing and Derek and Douglas were both with me at this conference this year and so there was a little vector off uh, with us talking about this kind of stuff. Here's an example of some of his work. Uh, he, he came to... It's interesting researching and trying to remember stuff about when someone appeared on, uh, in my narrative with things. So he came to see, uh, he came to a, a, a modular synthesizer thing in Manchester, and and I, and I was there with with the with Steve from Thunk, and Steve from Thunk just said, "Oh, will you bring your Vectrex? It'll help people just come over and look at the stuff that I've got to sell." I was like, "Yeah, fine, whatever. Um, I don't care. I'll do that." And and so Joe was there, and he was just like totally fixated on, on what was happening on this Vectrex. And I think I'd come across, I think I'd sent maybe one or two emails backwards and forwards about something else to do with teaching and uh, before. And then um, he was messaging me on the train on his way home. I've bought one. <laughs> He'd been just sat on the train on eBay just buying Vectrexes and getting ready to, to do all of this. And so this is some stuff that he's been working on much more recently, he's, he's been doing things with lasers, and this is using one of, this is some combination, I think, of Vectrex drawings, lasers, and then uh, this thing called the Three Trins RGB that a chap from the Netherlands called Geich has made uh, a nice video um, synthesizer kit for, which is, is really good fun. Uh, so he's managed to, co he's colorizing the images, uh, with mixing that sort of thing together. Um, Jono, he's, he's nice. He works for a company called Forum S uh, in the States, and he takes these amazing photographs using lenses with cutouts in them and stuff like that, and, uh, and shares those. Because when I first saw these pictures, I was like, how the hell did he do that? I can't get my Vectrex to do that. It's got all this blur stuff in it. That's, he's cheating. And then when I met him, he was telling me about it. Oh, yeah, I use these lenses with like big chunks cut out of them. Oh, that's really clever. Um, and at, I was at Superbooth chatting with him uh, in Berlin earlier this year, and he said, oh, I've got to show you this new module, the Spherical Wavetable Navigator. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, and so in here, it's got a load of wavetables in, and you can morph around them and, and kind of cruise around all of these sorts of shapes and things. And, uh, and he, after getting into this Vectrex stuff, he, I think he sort of helped a little bit with the development of it as, a, as, as an audio, as a visualizer, as well as a visual tool, as well as an audio tool. Um, so, uh, so that's quite an interesting thing that it's, not, it's being thought of beyond audio. I mean, when you look for demos of this um, on the internet, you do find more that are just focusing on the sounds that it makes. And it sounds similar to other wavetable modules that morph around and stuff, but it also will make cool pictures for you, so, so that's good. Um, and it's got lavender-colored 
LEDs. Brilliant. Chris Bennett, he's a machine. If you see him on, on video circuits and on the Vector Facebook group, he's just churning stuff out like crazy, isn't he? I didn't want to not mention him. He's, he's just doing stuff. It's not the best image um, ever, but he's got one of Benton's um, Vectrex as well. And uh, he just, he's on it. He's doing stuff. So props. Uh, I don't know what, is he using a laser? Does anyone know? Right. Okay. His images are fantastic. Um, so I just thought, yep. And this is like Whitney kind of style um, vertigo sort of laser stuff there then. They're really good. Right, where else am I? Oh, stuff I haven't delved into yet. How long do you want me to keep talking for? It's five past four. <laughs> I'll go quickly then. So some of the things that I need to look at and think about in the stuff that I'm interested in and doing, some of my images are starting to look a bit like this. So I'd like to find out more about the sort of mental connections and psychological connections, like why you feel more attracted to certain sorts of images or imagery than, than others. Um, certain oscillators that I've been using in particular sorts of ways have created images that look a bit like that. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering what the hell's going on and trying to think, I'm not being spiritual about it, I'm just trying to think about how there might be some sort of connection somehow with this sort of thing and um, those of us in the room that do experiment with this sort of stuff, you probably find that you'll set stuff up and you'll, you'll just leave it and you'll sit and look at it for quite a long time and it, these, these patterns are there and you just kind of I feel engrossed by it, and, and when things are sort of morphing around and stuff like that, then I, I'm happy just to sit and, and stare at it. Uh, and, and this was something else that cropped up, um, which I thought was quite interesting as well. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do about that, but I'm going to find out more about it because I think that's, that's something that could lead back to this sort of thing and into your brain uh, and sort of... Um, I don't know, some kind of psychological things. Um, these are the sorts of images that I really like to try and do. And these are things that really frustrate me. But this is what I'm going to try and do when I do my performance um, later on in the week. And try and create these sorts of beings. I don't know. Like I made a TIE fighter the other day. Or some kind of spaceship thing. Um, so so that was that's that. And... Oh yeah, these are, these are the other really important things. <laughs> the communities on the internet about this sort of stuff, but I think, uh, well, it's the internet, isn't it? This is good. This is good for an exhibition that included that sort of thing in it. And I haven't shown my worst slide yet. <laughs> I'm going to stop there because it is eight minutes past four. Um, thank you very much. I'll get rid of that. That's my bad reputation. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask me any questions about anything? Or do you just want to go out of the room now? I wasn't going to ask a question, Duff. I was just saying thank you for that, because I think it was a really good introduction to the whole general scene, kind of explains it to some people here who you know, might not be practitioners as well. Thank you. That kind of kicks it off really well. That's all right then. Job yeah. done. Cheers. Nice. Great. Thanks for listening. Cheers. <laughs>